Good evening, everybody. I'd like to welcome you to this general government meeting of July 6, 2022. The time is now 5 p.m. Uh, and if you would, a, how about a roll call, please? Councilmember Dennehy? Absent. Councilmember Schmisher? Here. Councilmember B. Smith? Here. Councilmember Stein? Here. Councilmember Tracy? Here. Councilmember Worthington? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Hamrick? Here. Mayor Smith? Here. Thank you, Cindy, for that. Uh, and tonight we're having a discussion about the police department propo proposed career development plan. And Ryan, is that you or is that yeah, the chief? We'll, we'll uh, hand it over to the chief here in just a moment. That, so uh, the career development plan is something that uh, chief has been working on and the, the PD has been working on for, for a while. Uh, something that uh, when we did our salary study last year, um, you know, realizing that, you know, from a retention and development standpoint, even a recruitment standpoint, there are uh, lots of opportunities there. So uh, this was something that uh, was familiar to, to Chief uh, at his previous agency, and uh, you know, I'll go ahead and hand it over to him so he can go through it and what we're talking about. Uh, what we're looking for today is, uh, you know, we're still working on putting this uh, Budget numbers behind this. This is this is the high-level concept, and what we're looking for is uh, is this something council wants to continue with? Should we include it in the budget when we start putting together the budget? Thank you, Mr. Stevens, Madam Mayor, uh, Mayor Pro Tem, members of council. Um, I'm here with Commander Walsh, who's uh, my administrative commander. Um, Ryan gives me a lot of credit, but I, I have to lean on him quite a bit. I just have the ideas and I throw it on his lap. So anything that I can't answer, I'm sure he'll be able to uh, entertain. Career development um, is, is an approach or pursuit that I think is in line with the marching orders that uh, your board gave me when I came on in November of 2020. Um, we're all uh, well acquainted with some of the uh, struggles in recent history. Um, with regards to retention and recruitment, uh, training, um, adding depth to our bench, those types of things. Um, it has been my experience of about 15 years with a career development plan, a robust career development plan, um, that uh, it's a heavy investment in your, your agency with heavy returns. Um, you, you fill the bench, um, you retain people, you recruit top quality people. Um, so as Ryan indicated, we're just going to kind of do a uh, overview tonight or this evening. Um, so we'll start here, a career development plan, systematic outline path for staff development, rewarding employees for personal and professional contributions to the organization and customers. Um, and that's, that's essentially what it, it boils down to. Um, we are investing in our uh, police department and our, our employees and in turn they are investing and uh, paying a return on to our community. Um, it's also in line with uh, our Equal Pay for Equal Work Act in Colorado. Uh, the career development plan is based in whole or in part um, on employee achievements uh, who have equal opportunity, um, which, is, which is of course very important. Um, as we walk through the career development plan, you'll see that those opportunities exist for everybody. Um, in line with our city's balanced scorecard initiative and our service excellence motto, um, it contributes to the PD's pursuits also of 21st century policing principles. With regards to recruitment, prospective employees want to know their employers uh, preferably have an established path for their advancement. Um, they want to know before they even join our department, um, do we have an idea of where they need to go and how to get there. Um, they're interested in their future with your organization and what that's going to look like. Um, professional and professional invested organizations have less struggles uh, with employee retention. Um, as we talked about just, uh, just recently, um, you know, the, hi the history of CCPD, the recent history has been um, training uh, depth of our bench, recruitment, and retention of, of those quality uh, players. Uh, 
So we get into our balanced scorecard. Um, and again, the strategic objectives outlined in our balanced scorecard, um, the career development plan addresses those issues and, and embraces the quality employee that's going to help us um, with attaining uh, each of our objectives. Um, you can see that uh, we are based on customer service, community engagement, program management, and operational excellence. Um, the CDP touches on each and every one of these, uh, these objectives, um, and we'll, we'll get more into that as we start outlining or going through uh, the specific criteria associated uh, with the rank structures within the career development plan. Ideally, it also helps us achieve those principles with 21st century policing. Um, when we invest in our employees, like we're talking about here tonight with the CDP, um, we're building trust and legitimacy uh, within the community. Uh, folks know that they can depend on our police department across the board. Of course, we're accountable uh, because the structure of the CDP with regards to policy and oversight um, and training and education is a very big component of uh, the career development plan. And of course, officer wellness and safety also play uh, a major role there. It also embraces or it's in, in line with our department's uh, vision and mission statement and the virtues of our department. Um, the CDP will promote each of these um, as we continue to uh, watch our officers progress through the plan through the program. We look at career development plan and that we understand there's five key motivators within the workplace. Um, number one, we wanna provide meaningful and challenging work. Number two, we wanna improve employees' lives. Um, I like to bring up Maslow's hierarchy because as we go through the plan, you'll see where self-actualization, esteem, respect, um, confidence, all of these factors the safety needs, all of these factors are present in that career development program as we watch the officers matriculate through. Um, recognition, employees want to be recognized. Um, that's a very uh, strong component of the CDP uh, because as they matriculate through the CDP, they're getting that recognition. recognition. And additionally, they're getting the compensation and benefits um, that are equitable to those rank structures. Um, and it builds a culture, a culture of, uh, I don't know if you've noticed, you probably noticed on all of our uh, police cars, the new arrivals, um, the, the city's motto is on there, service excellence. Um, so that's the culture that we're, we're uh, trying to inspire. Um, and according to Morgan McKinley, uh, these are the keys to motivating, motivation within the workplace. The career development plan can be described as a vehicle for enhancing personal, professional, and organizational excellence, a path for inspiration and motivation of our team. Um, as each employee uh, works their way through the career development plan and becomes subject matter experts in a variety of categories, which you know we've already enhanced um, our officers uh, abilities. We've we just recently promoted the sar training sergeant. We're starting our own in-service academy. Um, we have, over the last year, added three, I believe, um, subject matter experts in the area of uh, use of force and computer forensics. Um, so we're, it's a continuation of that, but we're we're uh, we're moving towards that. Um, the inspiration and motivation for the team. Developing those subject matter experts is absolutely critical. Um, you know, when I came here, um, you know, we had an honest look in the mirror, an evaluation of sorts, and determined that, you know, there was there was a there was a lack of that that bench depth. Um, so we've been working very hard to get people trained up and instill that uh, that sense of pride, that that confidence to go out there and do the job. Um, so the CDP serves that. The spirit of the CDP um, also is avoiding retirement on duty. Um, and in my 30 years, I um, have seen my fair share and I'm sure Commander Walsh has seen his fair share. And it's not necessarily 
um, a personal issue uh, where somebody chooses to not be engaged or not be enthusiastic, it oftentimes is because the organization has left them with no, no options. There's no motivation. There's no inspiration. Um, the CDP does that. Um, in my 15 years or so of implementing and managing the career development plan, um, I have n not seen anyone not be able to matriculate through and it expand that bench and expand the confidence level, expand the capabilities of the organization. Um, as I explained to Ryan and Ivy as we were talking behind the scenes as we were you know, putting this together, I had one employee in that time um, struggle and it was because um, you know, he just didn't see the value. Um, and in my estimation as a leader, I felt that we didn't inspire that individual, show him the value, um, and after a few years, he saw the value and he matriculated up where he should be, where his, his, uh, his level of expertise met his time and grade, grade and service um, so he could, he could move forward. Engaged and contributed employees absolutely provide service excellence, um, and that has been our, our biggest focus probably over the last year. CDPs, obviously, um, it is a powerful recruiting tool. I can tell you uh, unequivocally since um, we've started investing in our employees, um, our, our recruitment efforts have been stronger. We've seen higher interest. We've, we've attracted um, higher, higher caliber um, personnel. So, um, you know, today's applicants want to understand and see their opportunity for advancement. The career development plan, as you're getting ready to see, will lay that out and, and spell, spell it out uh, very clearly for them. Uh, professional policing organizations have fewer challenges with meeting uh, industry best practices um, and maintaining those strong teams. Um, I'm told that, uh, you know, probably 10 years ago, uh, Canyon City was in a, in a place where people stayed within the department. Um, there wasn't a lot of turnover. Um, recent past, we've not seen that. We want to get back to that. I can tell you from experience, um, in my former agency, we didn't have that turnover. People retired out of the agency. Um, they weren't leaving. Um, and I think a big part of it was that culture, that culture designed and uh, instituted by the career development plan, but the career development plan also reflects back on, on us as leaders um, because as I always tell our folks, we're all accountable. Um, we are accountable to them, they're accountable to us, we're all accountable to the community. Um, so you're building that culture. Um, professional uh, or roadmap for both professional or personal and organizational success, opportunity for both the individual and team to grow in a common direction. Uh, University of California, Berkeley, I just I found a couple things I thought was interesting and, and served our point here. <clears throat> Reports that career development increases employee motivation and productivity. Attention to career development helps you attract the top staff and retain those valued employees like we talked about. Um, supporting career development uh, and growth of your employee is a mandate by UC Berkeley and the philosophy of human resources management. I'm sure Ivy could talk more to that. Uh, but I believe them when they tell me that. Um, also, Berkeley tells us the support of career development is important because current information about the organization and future trends helps your employees create a more realistic career development goal. Um, again, they want to know where, where they should be, where they could be, um, you know, in five years, in 10 years, in 15 years. How do I get from patrol officer to chief? Um, the CDP helps them with that. And as we restructure and, and build our, our uh, assessment program for supervisors, um, we'll start intertwining education and other factors um, that will clearly lay out how to get to that, that point if that's, you, if that's your goal. Um, focus on skill development contributes to learning opportunities, opportunities for promotion, lateral moves, uh, employee career satisfaction, um, greater sense of responsibility, managing one's own career, um, being able to uh, see that, know what they need to do, and accomplish it 
that accomplishment builds confidence, builds resiliency, um, and uh, helps them move forward in a, in a productive manner. Um, all right, so now we're going to take a look at the actual plan. Um, as, you, as we move through here, um, this is police officer recruit. You'll notice um, that we have criteria list here in the second column, general requirements, prerequisites, timing, grade, and service, evaluations, advanced training, maintaining qualifications, disciplinary action at the time of advancement, and the application requirement. Um, as you'll note, uh, duly note, uh, that there's no requirements here for the police officer recruit. This is our newest employee coming in uh, with no academy, no experience. Police officer one, you'll notice right away in the prerequisite uh, column, uh, the appointment criteria, uh, completion of approved police academy, completion of CCPD field training, completion of approved police academy, or completion of approved field academy or field training program with another law enforcement agency or a valid out of state post certificate and qualified to challenge the Colorado post requirements and completion of an approved field training program with another uh, law enforcement agency. As we progress through the career development plan, these prerequisites and the other areas, time and grade evaluation, those will get, those will get heftier. Um, as we require more of those employees as they're moving forward. Police officer two, same requirements as a police officer one, only you'll see that we start introducing things like a community, one annual community project, four hours of instruction either as a lead or assistant at the police academy. Again, uh, investing and building that depth by having our officers engaging with other officers regionally and interacting and teaching. I, I don't know if you know, any of you have ever taught anything, but I had a very wise uh, police instructor tell me one time, if you wanna know a subject, teach it. Um, and I've taught many, many years, and that's a very true statement. So um, we want our officers going to the academy teaching these subjects because to teach it, they really have to know it. Um, you'll notice that there's, we start getting into community engagement events. Um, and then the time in grade and service, 24 months as a police recruit or police officer one, um, or 12 months as a police officer one and 36 months with another law enforcement agency. Because as we recruit those folks that are going to strengthen our bench, um, they're going to need to be recognized for their prior years of law enforcement experience, their, their accomplishments, that sort of thing. Yeah. Chief, I'm, I'm going to, while you take a drink, yeah, I'm going to yeah. cut in there real quick. You know, another uh, benefit of having uh, officers going and teaching at the academies is, is a recruitment piece. You're getting to know uh, those folks that are going through the academy and uh, building those relationships and, and hopefully uh, helping to fill uh, any vacancies that we might have by doing that as well. Very true. And I would say 50 to 60 percent of those uh, recruit or those cadets in those uh, city college academies are unspoken for. So they're looking for an agency. So it does give us a firsthand uh, look at uh, the quality of people that uh, are there. Um, evaluations, they have to have, maintain a, a rating of fully qualified. Advanced training, they have to have their FTO and skills instructor and another advanced 60 hours of advanced training. They have to maintain their post certifications less than 10 demerit points and not be on disciplinary probation at the time of the application. Senior officer, you notice the uh, prerequisites list grows extensively. Um, again, the FTO, skills instructor. Now we have to complete two of the five following, uh, teaching or leading an assistant role, uh, four hours a year, one annual community project, participation in a command approved administrative project. This is where we start challenging our officers to look at our community and identify issues out there that perhaps they can take a look at. Um, one current example is, I believe it was Ms. Stein asked about uh, looking at the crosswalks on Main Street and uh, uh, Officer uh, Jordan St. Louis is in the middle of that. In fact, he gave me a summary today that I'm gonna be sending to you, Ms. Stein, um, that talks about uh, the issue um, some resolution, um, some options, that type of thing. 
um, so that we start, we start focusing and challenging them in this capacity. Um, they have to be, uh, number four, they have to be a member of, uh, at the time we initially wrote this, we were part of the regional SWAT team. Um, we are starting our own SWAT team next year, so that will say CCPD SWAT team, uh, the canine unit, uh, or mental health co-responder, um, or member of two of the following committees. Again, getting in there, getting engaged, investing in uh, the community. Uh, we want them to be a member of the Shop with a Cop committee, the traffic safety unit that we're standing up, the bike unit that we've recently stood up that we hope to expand on next year, uh, peer support officer. We, we started the regional peer support uh, team this past year. Um, voluntary committees and others deemed appropriate by uh, the command staff um, and participation in at least two approved community engagement events. Um, 24 months as a police officer, two. 60 months with another law enforcement agency as a sworn officer in patrol or investigations and 12 months with CCPD as a police officer too. It's important that even though we're bringing them in um, and we're, we're using that, that experience, that prior experience to help fill our bench, that they, they have a, a strong footprint with us initially so they come to understand and, and become part of that, that vehicle. Um, evaluations have average score higher than fully qualified. No categories rated needs improvement or lower subcategories. Now some of these, like you, you might look at this and say, well, that's pretty steep. Well, we have high expectations. Our motto is service excellence. Um, to meet that goal or to help our employees reach and, and attain that level of service, um, we've instituted quarterly evaluations. So um, we do not just evaluate once a year. We're having that conversation four times a year so everybody knows what the expectations are, what the needs are, and we can all move together in that direction. And that's not just reflective on the subordinates, right? Um, we are instituting a dual evaluation purpose uh, where our line personnel will evaluate our supervisors, our supervisors will evaluate our commanders, and our commanders will evaluate our chief. Again, we're all accountable so that we all know how we're doing. Um, so that's how we're going to help them maintain that very high standard in the evaluations category. Um, the advanced training, field training officers, skills instructor, and other advanced classes totaling 100 hours of advanced training. And of course, the same posture, maintaining your post certificate, no less than 10 demerit points and you can't be on disciplinary probation. The master officer. Um, very much the same. Uh, again, we're just expanding the portfolio a little bit. Um, so we are requiring the teaching and the engagement at the academy, uh, the community project, uh, command uh, approved project or membership in those, those teams and participation in at least two community engagements. The time and grade in service is the biggest transition here to master officer, 36 months as a senior officer, 84 months with another law enforcement agency and in patrol or investigations and 24 months with CCPD. And again, um, all the criteria for senior officer, the 160 advanced training hours and the same disciplinary standard and maintaining your qualifications and higher than fully qualified on your evaluations. Um, we have a very similar uh, path for our detectives bureau. Um, so detective one, demonstrated record criminal investigations, arrests and above average case clearance rating, um, community engagement, the time and grade 36 months CCPD, 24 months at the rank of officer two or higher, um, 24 months with CCPD including 12 months at the rank of officer two or higher and, 30, and 36 months with another law enforcement agency, excuse me. Evaluation is fully qualified and the same disciplinary standards, uh, same certifications, <coughs> excuse me, certification standards and uh, a letter of intent, that's, that's sta standard. Uh, Detective two, we start getting into those, identifying those specialized school. <coughs> the Reed interview school is, uh, un, uh, it, it is absolutely one of the, the finest interview uh, schools for criminal interrogations. 
homicide or other, other specialized investigations training. And if you're a narcotics investigator, uh, particularly informant management. Um, and again, you see those timelines go up 24 months as a detective one, 12 months as a detective one and with CCPD and 36 months as a detective with another law enforcement agency. Again, we're trying to attract those quality people from those other agencies and not ignore all of that experience and, and, thing, and uh, time that they had previously. Fully qualified evaluations, 100 hours of advanced investigations training, and the same uh, qualifications, discipline uh, standards as the uh, Detective One. Senior Detective, again, we're just expanding on the portfolio, particularly in the prerequisites and time and grade. Um, and you'll see with the detective, senior detective, the membership with the committees um, or member with traffic safety, bike unit, uh, SWAT team, those types of things, K-9, <coughs> excuse me. And then a time and grade in service, 24 months as a detective two, 12 months de de detective two with CCPD or and 48 months with detective with another agency as a sworn uh, officer in either patrol or investigations. Again, full, higher than fully qualified in, in uh, your evaluations. The 160 hours of advanced training continues, maintaining your qualifications and uh, no disciplinary probation. Whew, that was a lot. So I, um, I've, I've done my level best to give you an overview and I, I know it's a lot of information to digest. Um, as Ryan said, we're, we're gonna have uh, several conversations about this, but um, I would answer any questions that uh, you folks may have. Thank you, Chief. Do we have any questions from our panel up here? And we can, this is this is more informal, so you don't need to. Quick question. Um, having been in the corporate world for way too many years, uh, is the possibility of advancing limited to an opening? Is it have you a possibility of limits of so many that could be, say, Detective One, and those types of that's, things? That's a great question, Councilwoman. Um, and Ryan and I had this, this conversation. Um, my rathers, my experience was no caps. You want everybody in your patrol division to be a master officer. You want everybody in your detective bureau to be a senior detective, um, because when you get there, you're providing a level of service that is unmatched. Good. Um, Follow-up question is then, of course, there is a budget. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> and so if you have 10 people that are suddenly now detective ones or whatever, that's going to have an impact on your existing budget. Do you have ways around that to make sure everybody still has that ability? Because that sometimes that's the enters in. Bullet. Absolutely. Okay. Um, Great. We can forecast. Um, fortunately for us right now, um, we don't have a lot of those top enders. When we transition to this program, we're not gonna see that right away. Um, that will come in time. Um, and how we make those revenues, uh, those, those adjustments to meet those revenue obligations, I don't know. Um, I, I will lean heavily on Ryan and, <laughs> and uh, Ms. Nordyke, uh, but um, it's a worthwhile investment, I can say that. Um, but we can project, right? So we know where each of our employees are right now in time and grade. We know where they are at in training. We know where they're at in discipline. So each year we can start looking in, in uh, March or April, hey, this is, this is where we're at. This is what we're looking at. And we can project those numbers to Mr. Stevens and, and Ms. Nordyke. I really like the quarterly evaluations because there's nothing worse than going into yes, an evaluation period and say, well, you didn't do this, this, and this. Yes, At least you're giving them a chance to catch up during the year or whatever. Yes, so ma'am. I think that's great. Thank you. Uh, Councilwoman Worthington, the, from my perspective, the question about the budget is kind of why we're here, too, okay. <laughs> to make sure that we can support that they have what they need. That they they have what they need. Okay. Yep. Uh, just to, to go back on that point, and you know, Chief Schick mentioned, um, you know, either fortunately or unfortunately, I guess fortunately from a budget perspective, but unfortunately, 
um, from an experience perspective, we, we do have a fairly young agency, and that's why yes. having a career development plan uh, in place is, is important to make sure that we are building that bench strength. And, and a commitment, important yeah. and a commitment. Absolutely. But we, we still need to see some numbers, right? Looking into 2023, I mean, do you have any projections of what we need to be looking at to accommodate? So when we did the uh, salary study, um, I think we, um, we had talked about you know, $500,000 a year commitment for, and I think that was for the entire, the entire city. I think what we're looking at, it would be included within that $500,000 per year. Okay. Yes. Oh, Amy, jump on in here. Thanks so much, Mayor Pro Tem. It's always a little hard when you're on Zoom. I never want to cut anybody else off who's who's in the room. I did have a couple of questions. Um, first off, thanks so much, Chief, for that presentation and for all of the hard work that you've clearly put into it. As you very articulately explained, it's incredibly important that we have career development plans and kind of people understand the opportunity that they have within the Canyon City Police Department to be able to advance and progress and stay um, and, and really have that professional development opportunity and that career advancement here. Um, I did have a couple of questions. Uh, so first off, the evaluations, um, the, the ones that you're now doing quarterly, I was wondering if you could share a little bit more about what are the categories that you use in those evaluations and kind of how are you evaluating the officers? Thanks. Sure. So we try to make the, the categories of the evaluations um, reflective of their job duties um, so that uh, we're touching on all the characteristics that we've defined essential um, to providing that service excellence that we're talking about. Um, I could be, I'd be glad to share with you uh, copies of the quarterly evals, and, and it is a work in progress. Um, we just, uh, in fact, this second quarter was our first quarter. Um, getting those in, uh, got my first stack on my desk today, so I'm excited about that. But I'll be glad to share with you. It's it's generic, but it's specific enough that we can we can keep our employees focused on where they need to head um, towards the next quarter. And then, in, as we integrate the career development program, of course, we can focus them in that path. Gotcha. Understood. Um, that would be incredibly helpful if you don't mind. Um, I'm also really appreciative of, of your stance and kind of um, approach on the evaluations that everyone in the agency is being evaluated. I am curious as to if you considered the 360 evaluation process so that it's not just um, uh, one way, but it's kind of everyone looking at maybe not on a quarterly basis, but every so often um, kind of uh, around the horn, whether it's your supervisor, your subordinate, or your peers. Well, we're, we're, we're reflecting or, or taking a look at those uh, 360 evaluations twice a year. So it'll be biannual. Oh, that's wonderful. Okay. Um, Mayor Bertem, I did have a couple more questions, but I don't want to um, take all the time. I know that we have the URA meeting immediately following that. We're, we're, we're doing good on time yeah. so far. Um, okay, then just a couple of others from my perspective. Um, I was uh, really uh, love the idea of, of one of the factors being the time instructing uh, at, uh, at a police academy, um, both from the recruitment standpoint and, and from as well what you mentioned in terms of once you are able to teach something, that's when you really truly have inculcated it within your own ethos and your own self. Um, I did have, have two other specific questions. One, I was surprised that it was disciplinary probation at the time of application as opposed to disciplinary probation during the you know immediate uh, preceding 12 months or, or something like that. And I was wondering if you could speak a bit more to that. This, the disciplinary probation is identified in our disciplinary policy. Um, and it, we have five groups of disciplinary classifications. Um, and underneath each of those groups are uh, de defined parameters or sanctions um, associated with those. Now, um, not each sanction or each category requires disciplinary probation. Um, of course, as you get into the higher categories, there's disciplinary probation. And disciplinary, disciplinary probation 
from a career development uh, standpoint is is a death sentence essential essentially um, so uh, it's very important that we're having those quarterly evaluations con uh, contacts and communication um, that our employees are engaged with our supervisors and vice versa um, to avoid those those pitfalls but they do happen from time to time um, but our our discipline policy is also progressive in nature so we don't unless the infraction is very significant um, the the progression is slow and and it's steady it's designed to be the same for everybody um, so the sanctions are clearly spelled out uh, before before the action occurs so folks know um, what those are if that I don't did I answer your question no, but I think it's because I didn't frame it clearly enough. Um, thank you so much for explaining your disciplinary process, and, and it, um, you know, really glad to to hear your methodology behind it. Um, my question was, and I may have misunderstood um, uh, the presentation. I believe you had mentioned that someone wouldn't be able to be promoted if they were on disciplinary probation at the time yes. of application. You cannot. In my, yeah. oh, go ahead. No, no, you're you're correct. You heard it right. You cannot be. You cannot advance if you're on disciplinary probation at the time, and you only get to apply once a year for this. So everybody applies at the same time. We evaluate all the applications and we make the necessary advancements. Um, my, my question was just understanding that disciplinary probation um, is a pretty, pretty, as you said, a death sentence is a pretty significant um, uh, issue or concern. I was surprised that it was only um, a disqualifier if it hap if it if you happen to be on disciplinary probation at the time of application, as opposed to if you had been on disciplinary probation during the the preceding 12 months. Thanks. Well, the disciplinary probation, the way it works in our disciplinary process is, uh, disciplinary probation typically can run anywhere from a month to 12 months to 24 months, to 36 months, depending on uh, the, the seriousness of the, uh, the infraction. Um, so uh, thankfully, uh, we don't have a lot of those um, because uh, most of our folks are, are focused and working hard and trying to do, put their best foot forward and, and meet that motto of service excellence. Um, there are times when uh, discipline, unfortunately, is necessary um, to help put an employee back in between those lines and, and get them refocused. Um, I can't tell you that uh, in my 15 years of experience that, um, that disciplinary probation uh, never impacted anybody, it absolutely did. There were folks that uh, didn't make their mark that year because they were on disciplinary probation. I think it's important to note another portion of the disciplinary policy that is included with the uh, career development plan, and that is the demerit points. So the disciplinary probation is a sanction that essentially looks into the future and says you're going to have this penalty hanging over you for a certain amount of time from the date of adjudication forward. But our policy on the career development plan also incorporates our demerit points. The demerit points go back 12 months and look at uh, a total accumulation of points and total discipline over the previous 12 months. So we do incorporate both their previous history and their current sanctions when we look at the disciplinary uh, policy in combination with our career development plan. Could, could you share with us what maybe kind of the range of, of, of um, of conditions that create the merit points, you know, the low, middle, high, something like that, so we understand better what that, what, how that yes. works. So a very low uh, violation would amount to essentially no points and no disciplinary probation is something along the lines of uh, somebody turned in a very poorly written report, mm -hmm. uh, especially if they had been counseled verbally by their supervisor on a previous yeah. occasion on a similar poor report uh, as opposed to on the opposite end of the spectrum you have things like integrity issues insubordination, insubordination. particularly if they involve uh, a serious issue uh, if we had uh, insubordination in say a tactical situation where 
lives are on the line. Those are things that are going to be very high level. And then in the middle, you have things that uh, would include uh, repeats, tardiness, or absenteeism. Uh, other areas would be uh, safety violations, particularly. Procedural type issues also? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Yes, sir. So the discipline policy is such that most of these violations, uh, a first offense is a relatively low level, and again, because it's progressive, the more violations or the more serious the violation, the further you advance into these policies. Do you, are you, do you award, do you award um, varying amounts of demerits depending on the total circumstance? Yes. Yes, sir. And those are, those are designated within the policy within uh, generally a five to Parameter. ten point range depending on the severity and the Disciplinary uh, history. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure. Totality Great. of circumstances. Thank you. Amy, I didn't mean to, to, to jump on no. your questions there. No, not at all. I thought, I thought that was really helpful in there, Pratam. Um, I guess speaking of that, from, from the presentation, it seems like it was very objective. So if you meet these things, then you will definitely be promoted. Is there room for subjectivity based on individual circumstances and based on um, based on the leadership's uh, understanding of the, the individual and whether or not they might be ready for that? Well, we try to remove all subjectivity. And, and you know, like I said in the beginning of the, the presentation, the idea here is that um, we not only identified the path for success for them, but we've made it available to everybody and it's very clearly spelled out so once you've checked all the boxes it's pretty much an automatic uh, promotion or advancement there is some room for some subjectivity when you look at the senior and master level positions particularly when you look at the policy that discusses uh, other assignments that are deemed uh, appropriate by command staff. Yeah, the, so the community have, engagement. Uh, an officer who has a particular area that they really feel that they're interested in or that can really benefit yeah. the community, we can make that part of their assignments to fulfill one of the requirements of this plan. Yes. Thank you so much. And then just my final comment and question. Um, thanks as well for including the balanced scorecard. I think that that's a it's really exciting that CPPD is so far along um, with regard to finalizing and beginning to, to track um, indicators against that that balance scorecard. I was a little bit curious as to if it if um, if that was the totality of what was presented on the screen, or if there were other indicators that had um, more to do with public safety and crime rates and kind of obviously the overall underlying mission and um, and uh, goal of CCPD. I'm not sure what your question was, Amy. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, <laughs> I think I'm a little too jet lagged and I'm not doing a good enough job um, being specific. Um, so thank you for including the balanced scorecard. It's really exciting yeah, yeah. that CCPD has, has developed that. I was wondering if what was presented in your presentation was the entirety of CCPD's um, uh, metrics against which you're tracking for the balance scorecard? I, I think so, yes. Okay, my, my only question, and I'd love to have further conversations about it, if that's okay, um, is I was surprised that there weren't um, specific indicators related to crime rates and um, related more to public safety uh, and was just curious as to, to the rationale behind that and, and would love to have further conversations about it if that's possible. Oh, absolutely. I'd, I'd love to have further uh, conversations about it. Um, the Balanced Scorecard Initiative was our, our, first, uh, our first look at this and um, the Operational Investment or Excellence Program Management, we do have um, some things in here about department accreditation, uh, maintaining and, and updating our policy manual with industry best practices, um, pers the personnel evaluations and supervisor evaluations. Um, the community walk and talks are, are, you know, our community engagement's a huge part of that. Um, and then we talk about our, uh, our code enforcement, right, activities, uh, pro proactive activities versus seek fix, uh, C-click fix complaints. 
um, and our case management. Our case management goes a long way towards um, how we're responding to crime in the community, um, how, we're, how we're investigating those crimes, um, how, how well are we closing our, our what's our clearance rating? Um, are we meeting national averages? We, we above, we below. Um, so there's a little bit of, of, of that in there for sure. Absolutely. I think the, um, and, and apologies, I know that we saw a draft of this at the last council retreat, um, but, but we, we haven't actually seen um, the police, de at least to my knowledge, the police department's um, uh, more final version of the balance scorecard. One of the, one of the key components that I think a lot of your activities are working towards in terms of the community engagement and the um, uh, you know, career development and accreditation is actually reducing crime rates um, through mitigation and prevention. Um, so I, I was just curious as to if it was possible to also track some of those metrics. Uh, that's all. But, but absolutely agree that you have a lot of really important metrics that, that are already in there. Yeah, and balanced scorecards will come back before council in September uh, for review. And um, the chief and the, the PD are also working on a quarterly crime report as well. Chief Chick, I have a question. Yes, are you done, Amy? I yes. am. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank, thank you. Um, my question is, um, when new officers are brought into the department, do you, uh, is a buy-in to the, your process part of your interviewing process with them? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. The, the very final, um, and there are a number of, of vetting instruments that they go through from polygraph to psychologicals, um, the, back, the intense background investigation. Their final um, vetting hurdle would be mm -hmm. me. Um, we sit down and have a very uh, open conversation about um, what our, our objectives are, what our perspective is, um, and are they a good fit for us? Mm -hmm. Are we a good fit for them? Um, that is uh, the final um, conversation uh, before we make a determination of whether or not um, we're moving forward with that person. And um, I can tell you that uh, we don't move forward with every single one of them. I was just wondering because I realized that across the country, um, there are a lot of different cultures in police departments, and maybe this isn't the approach that other, some other departments use. So I would think that they should know up front that that's what we expect. Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right, thank yes, you. Yes, ma'am. I, I think that's a, a very fair statement, and we had that conversation today talking about uh, another uh, restructuring uh, endeavor that we're looking at, and it's, and it's important for us to convey to any prospective employee exactly who we are, what we are, the expectations, um, so that uh, we maintain um, that transparency, we maintain our credibility. Um, there should be no surprises once they raise their right hand and, and sign uh, the oath for uh, the clerk. Yeah, and we, we also want to make sure that we're setting up with the right, right expectations right, right from the beginning. So, okay. um, I have a question for you, Commander Walsh. So, Chief Schick, I mean, this is something that you're familiar with and implemented in a previous department in your career. But this is new for us at the CCPD. It's new for you. It's new for our officers. And I was curious, what are your thoughts and how do you think this will be received by our officers? So as part of developing this, I've taken drafts of this policy to our supervisors' meetings, and I've discussed this with some of our line-level officers. And I have yet to find anyone who was not in favor of this plan. The, well, one of the challenges in a small department, as I'm sure you realize, is officer advancement. And our officers can see that you know, we have detective positions, but they don't come open very often. We have canine, but those guys don't want to give up their dogs. Those positions don't come open very often. This gives them a distinct way to, A, advance in their own performance, and B, 
become a more valuable member to their team and to the department in general. That's a very important distinction that I didn't touch on. Um, and it, it, was, it, was, it was true in my, my older agency because we were very like size. Those promotional opportunities, those opportunities for canine, detective, SWAT, in a smaller footprint agency, they don't come open that often. So the whole premise when the career development plan started many moons ago was there are going to be formal leaders and we want to have informal leaders. Um, we want everybody in the agency to be a leader, but they can't all be sergeants. They can't all be lieutenants. So we want to create a path that instills that leadership, that in informal leadership, gives them an area to become a subject matter expert, um, provide for themselves and their families comfortably while staying, remaining focused on their mission and, and uh, vision of the agency. <coughs> And, and along those lines, I know we have other council members that want to ask some questions, but the, uh, you know, in looking at the, the materials we were provided, one of the things that this uh, says is assignment of a particular rank does not indicate granting of authority over any other rank. And, um, but, but rank is the word that's used through, throughout the document. Have you, have you thought about, um, the, perhaps the difference between rank and pay grade. Uh, is there any is there any virtue in <clears throat> because because the, looking from the outside, how would I tell whether a uh, police officer two or police or officer first class uniform patrol has <clears throat> has authority over another officer? Is there some way to do that, or is this or is this kind of internal knowledge in the department? Well, it's not entirely or exclusively <coughs> internal knowledge because mm -hmm. we will put rank insignias on there so they will be distinguished as a senior officer or a master officer. Sure. Um, and again, those are informal leaders. Now, they don't necessarily hold authority over individuals, but they're, I have found in my, my years of experience, informal leadership is often uh, more um, influential than formal leadership. Um, once you reach that, <clears throat> that status in your career, you looked, on, looked upon very differently. And when those people uh, suggest something, um, folks around them tend to gravitate towards it. Um, and that's why the standard's so high to get to the master and senior levels. Um, so, while there's no formal authority, the recognition is a big part. Um, and I've never heard uh, one single complaint about uh, the rank structure involved in the career development plan because it's, it all comes back to recognition, accountability, um, and they're proud of that, right? And it builds their confidence and it builds a team. Um, so um, I've never looked at it from that perspective, um, but I've, I've never experienced any negative uh, from it as well. Gotcha. That the uh, it just it just seems to me that 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 there's another concept there that would that would help differentiate because because rank generally indicates some degree of authority uh, and but we also wanted in this program as I understand it to indicate some some degree of compensation and recognition. And there is a there is a degree of accountability. I mean, if the mm -hmm. sergeant is out for three weeks because they, they hurt themselves or you know their wife had a child or something. Um, the goal is, as I said, to have master, excuse me, master officers across the board. We're not gonna have that. But we will certainly have master and senior officers on each shift and those will be our people who step up um, to take the rein when the sergeant's not there. Thank you. Thank you. For a, for a form of visible recognition, uh, there are other departments, uh, Pueblo, yeah. Uh, when a Pueblo, for example, has an officer that reaches their equivalent of the police officer too, that officer is uh, promoted to corporal. It doesn't actually give them any uh, supervisory authority, uh, but they get a couple of stripes. Mm -hmm. um, and it'll be reflected on their name tag. Exactly. We have previously had a field training officer or instructor uh, nameplates or, or attachments to the nameplates 
or uh, sleeve rockers, that sort of thing is. Uh, they work hard for those certifications and they like, they like to be recognized. I Absolutely. think Fremont County SO does corporals as well, yeah. correct? Yeah. Fremont County does do corporals. However, their corporals do have a certain Super amount of supervisory okay. authority. It's, it's a good um, process. Um, I came from CDOC. Um, in, uh, any kind of evaluation was done annually, one time. It was usually for supervisors. It was a, a process that was something they didn't want to do. Um, so everybody got the standard ranking. Um, and, and there was there was really no reason behind it other than they, it was something that they had to do by state. I like the quarterly yeah. evaluations because it's been my experience that most supervisors reflect on the last two months of an employee's right. employment in their evaluation. Um, we haven't taken the notes. We haven't did, did our homework to truly evaluate somebody right. for a whole year. No, what a great process. Thank you guys for your hard work. Oh, thank you. Other questions by the panel? Sure. Um, this has been real helpful just to hear the detailed explanation. Uh, and maybe, what, I'm not sure, but maybe what John's alluding to is um, in terms of who supervises whom, maybe that's a separate document. That's more of an org chart. Is that right? And so yes, this is a way of saying what, it's like a rank and man system versus rank and job. And when I worked for the state years ago, I always wished they had a rank in man system because it, it gives, it's so much more motivating for yes, the employee and it lays out for you what you need to do if you want to advance or whatever it is. Uh, rank and job systems do not have that kind of motivation. So this has been helpful to hear. But if you have anything you want to say about the org chart or how you how you illustrate who is supervising whom, I guess, is a simple way to say it. Go ahead, Tim. Oh, I thought you were going to address it. Um, again, formal leadership, informal leadership. We will have those informal leaders develop through this program. Um, and it will happen naturally. Um, I, I've seen it time and time again. Um, when you reach that pinnacle of your career where you have 160 hours of advanced training, you have eight or 10 years of experience, it does not take long for the rest of the folks to gravitate around you and look to you to give answers. Um, and oftentimes, uh, you know, if we've done our job well, um, the sergeant doesn't have to do very much at all because the informal leaders have already paved the way with what shift should look like, how we're going to answer our calls, how we're going to respond to our cases, that type of thing. And Councilwoman Tracy, we, we do have a PD org chart as well. So we do. Uh, there, you know, direct reports for, to each sergeant, and you know, it goes down to that detail. Which is different from the description of this kind of a system, related to obviously, but not the same thing. So thanks. Thank you, Chief. I, we're really at the end of our time here. I know I've got a couple of more questions, but the, uh, we need to be respectful of the, of the uh, uh, panel that's following us here. So uh, with that. Well, uh, I've I'm taken some notes. I'll send some documents. If you have more questions, just email me. The, uh, it would, it's, uh, it, 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 the questions I have are, are uh, somewhat general and, and are good to have in the open. And so, so I appreciate the, the offer to, to correspond, but, it, but it, the, the, the types of questions I would like to ask and the, you know, are, are things that the public should hear. And okay. so, so, but uh, nonetheless, we, we do need to be respectful of the, the panel that's following us. So uh, unless there's other questions, we're adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.